Last week we talked about chemical toxins. Today I'd like to talk about metal toxins, specifically mercury, aluminum, and lead. One of the greatest sources of mercury toxicity we have is from the dental fillings in our own mouth. It used to be that fillings were made out of tin or gold if you could afford it. Then in the 1800s, dentists were exposed to a new technology from Europe, which was the dental amalgam, mixtures containing mercury. Now, the American Dental Association at the time required its members to pledge never to put mercury in someone's mouth because it was known that mercury was toxic. Anybody who did that was called a quack. Quack from quack silver, which is the German word for quicksilver, which is mercury. Unfortunately, economics won out because it was cheaper, faster, and easier to put mercury fillings in, and this became the dental standard of care. Dental fillings are not inert. They release mercury vapor. Here's a video showing one dental filling releasing vapor. On average, a mercury filling releases 17 micrograms of mercury per day, but up to 500 micrograms if you drink hot liquids, like to your coffee, grind your teeth at night, uh, or smoke. Now, here's another video showing the effect of mercury on a nerve. You can see it's melting. Now remember, the brain is a giant bundle of nerves. There is enough mercury in one dental filling to force the closing of a 10-acre lake, according to EPA guidelines. If you've ever had mercury fillings in your mouth, you may want to consider our Nervidine product. Okay, let's talk about aluminum. Aluminum is found in cookware, antiperspirants, feminine hygiene products, and it's in our water supply to a huge extent. Remember last week how we talked about how municipalities are recycling sewage water to reclaim as drinking water? Well, that's a lot of stuff floating in the drinking water. So they have to clear it out. And what they use is aluminum. Aluminum flocculates or binds to all of the things floating in the water supply and they drop out of solution and then you don't get them. Well, that's the idea. The problem is, it's very hard to perfectly calculate, moment by moment, how much aluminum should be put in the water. So, if you don't put enough in, you've got all sorts of things floating about that shouldn't be there that could get people ill. Therefore, they'll put a little extra in, to be sure. Which means we're drinking this. But it flocculates us just like it flocculates the water supply. Our blood is a colloidal suspension. That means there's the liquid, the plasma of the blood, and lots of things floating around. Red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets. And if we flocculate our bloodstream, all those things drop out of solution. Well, that's one of the ways that people can get heart attacks and have uh, failing kidneys. So one of the things you can do if you suspect that your water supply is uh, overflocculated is something as simple as a little potassium citrate in your water. Be mindful, it's very strong stuff. You're going to need a scientific scale to get the right amount, or if you buy it in capsules, that'll work too. So there's the aluminum. Okay, let's talk about lead. Lead's been in the news a lot, starting with Flint, Michigan, and then now town after town is showing up with high lead levels. What's going on is uh, not only are we doing better testing to find out places where industry has illegally dumped uh, lead uh, into the groundwater, but the water supplies of this country are getting old. And a lot of them were done with lead solder in the pipes. So drinking water that's going through these pipes, getting lead. Uh, one of the things that some municipalities will do will be to add chemicals to make it less likely for the lead to come out of the pipes and into the water. But then you've got the problem of the chemicals, and the lead still gets in. Lead is associated with decreases of maximum lifespan, meaning if we would normally live to 80, 
Uh, the more lead in the tissue, the shorter the lifespan. Another issue with lead is that it lowers IQ. For every 30 micrograms of lead in the bloodstream, IQ drops 10 points. So that's another issue. In our lifetime, we will consume approximately a third of a teaspoon of mercury, a teaspoon of lead, and three pounds of aluminum. The problem with getting metals out is they bond very strongly to tissue. Lead looks like calcium, so the body incorporates it in the bones. Aluminum looks like magnesium, and the brain loves magnesium, so it goes up into the brain, hence the connection with Alzheimer's. Mercury looks like selenium, which most people are deficient in. So mercury goes up into the thyroid and causes thyroid disorders, among other things. So what we need to do is to find something that has a greater affinity for the metal than our own tissue. One thing that you can use is EDTA. EDTA is short for ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid. Tetra is four. Acetic acid is basically vinegar. So what you've got are four vinegar groups attached together to a protein. Now, EDTA has a very strong bond for toxic metals, stronger than the bond makes for our own, uh, with our own body. So when we get it into our system, the EDTA will literally tear it away from us and hang on to it. Chelation has a number of amazing effects. One thing people don't realize is that calcium can actually act as a toxic metal, not because of what it is, but because of where it goes. As we age, calcium tends to leave the bones and go in the soft tissue, in the breasts, in the prostate, in the arteries, in the brain, in the kidneys, it goes everywhere. So as we get older, we have to start thinking of calcium deposition as well. And chelation is known to be able to support the body in dealing with calcifications. The only requirement is that you use a chelator that doesn't already have calcium bonded to it. Most of the chelators out there are bonded to calcium, which means if they bump into another calcium, there's no differential charge there. It won't let go of one calcium for another. That's why in designing metacardium, I chose to bond the EDTA to magnesium and potassium, both of which can be released by the EDTA in exchange for a calcium group. Now we have calcium EDTA going through the system, and if it bumps into something like lead or mercury, it'll drop the calcium for the lead or mercury. But now the calcium becomes a nutritional element. It's no longer in the wrong place, and assuming that we're doing a little exercise and getting enough vitamin K2, that calcium can then go and do its proper function, perhaps get back into the bone.